Turn your Bibles tonight to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would please. I want to welcome Bill Cody with us tonight. Good to see you, my friend. Haven't seen you for a while. We're glad to have you with us again tonight. Praise the Lord for you. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll begin reading. You can follow with me in verse 1. The Bible says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye do. Let's bow for prayer. We thank you tonight as we come again on this Lord's Day before you. And Lord, we bring not only our tithes and offerings, not only our songs of praise, and our, not only our prayers, but we bring ourselves and set ourselves before you and ask that you might minister to us, for surely we are a needy people, and Lord, we need your ministry by your spirit from your word into our hearts so that we can have the grace and strength and power we need to honor you with our lives. I pray it help each and every one of us. I pray, my Father, you might open the lips of your servant to speak and the heart of your people to hear and with ears that hear and hearts that understand that you might be glorified, your Son, the Lord Jesus, might be magnified. Your people might be edified and sinners might be saved. We'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. You might think you heard that passage of Scripture somewhere before. You did. You heard it this morning. But, you know, you can take a passage of just 11 verses in the Scripture and preach about 20 sermons right out of those 11 verses. And so we find ourselves there again tonight with the same verses, different subject. I want to ask this question, what is going on? As we look around us, we are witnessing the decay and perhaps the demise of a nation's character, its principles, its morals, and its spiritual underpinnings. There is a voice that has grown dim, and in some cases even silent. The voice that once cried from the rooftops, seems to have turned into a voice crying in the wilderness. In these days in which we live, it behooves us as born-again people, as Christians, as Bible believers, to consider our testimony that we should be excited. We should be encouraged. And we should be an example of those who are saved and who we belong to, the Lord Jesus Christ. In these last days, there are perilous times, that's for sure, and it's dangerous days, but it's also exciting days. It's an exciting time to live. Our talk should have a walk, and our claim should have a clout. The times such as they are, our Christian testimonies could mean more than ever before. Our Christian testimonies could mean more now, perhaps, than at any other time in history. Our light could shine a little brighter than it's ever shown before. Because as the times around us get darker, the light always seems a little brighter. But as Christians, we've got to let that little light shine. As a child, we heard that song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No! I'm going to let it shine. And that's what we need to do. And I believe there is some in this passage that helps us to see that. And I speak specifically of verse number 6. The Bible says, Therefore let us not sleep 
as do others. But let us watch and be sober. My first point tonight is don't sleep. Now the word sleep has several applications in the Bible, both literal and figurative. Matter of fact, two different uses of the word are right here in our text. In this verse, verse 6, it says, Therefore, let us not sleep. And then you look over in verse 10, it says about Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Now, I understand the two different uses of that verse, but it's interesting that it works no matter what usage you have. You'll understand that in just a second. Sleep can refer to physical death. I believe that's what it's referring to in verse 10. Christians who fell asleep, that's, how, that's the phrase that they used. They had fallen asleep in Christ. But the word sleep can also refer to spiritual slumber, as we find in verse 6. Spiritual slumber is when a Christian lives their life as an unlearned, uninvolved, uninterested in spiritual things, someone who's neglecting spiritual things, caught up in the less important. That would be a person who's in spiritual slumber. They're not alert. They're not awake spiritually. They're saved, but they're kind of just uh, couch potato Christians, you know. They're lounge chair Christians. Uh, they, they sleep their lives away spiritually. But then the word can also refer to a moral malaise. Not being careful concerning moral issues, unconcerned, a lack of personal separation. And so the word sleep has those three different meanings. We find two of them in our text. We find the spiritual sleep in verse 6. We find the physical death mentioned in verse 10. Now, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, addresses the issue of being awake both morally and spiritually. Doesn't it seem like there's been a cloud covering the minds of people morally in this century? Doesn't it seem like the eyelids of our country are kind of closing to the moral issues of our time? There's a moral slumber going on. People are, are you know, when, have you ever been asleep and uh, you had a sense or a feeling that somebody was in the room, but you just couldn't get yourself to wake up to go check it out? Yeah. I've been like that. I'd be laying there, and I, I just know somebody's in the room. I'm trying to come up out of there. <laughs> and I just can't get up out of my slumber to really check around and see what's going on. I think that's what's happening morally in our country. We've been anesthetized little by little. We're getting little shots of, anest uh, uh, of an anesthesia to, Every, you know, every, every so often. And we're falling asleep as Christians. Spiritually. And morally. And it has been happening since the day of the Apostle Paul. Isn't that incredible that in the first century of Christianity, Paul has to say, therefore let us not sleep. Isn't it incredible that in the first century of Christianity, the Apostle Paul had to say, awake to righteousness. For some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. How much more so would he have write this to us in the 21st century? As children of the light and children of the day, we are told to be awake, we're told not to sleep, and we are told to watch and be sober. That's part of being awake, isn't it? Part of being alert spiritually is to be watching. And this word sober simply means to have self-control, have control of oneself. Dear Christian, we're supposed to control our faculties. We're supposed to control our language. We're supposed to control our actions and our reactions and our thoughts and our lusts. It seems today it's all out of control. I mean, listen, we're talking about stuff now that it, as I grew up, we didn't even know existed. We never heard some of the things we're hearing today. We never saw some of the things we're seeing today. We, I can't believe what's going on. And I attribute it to the spiritual slumber of Christians who are asleep at the wheel, morally, spiritually, ethically, politically. They refuse to see. 
They have slumbering eyes. Sleepy time Christianity. You know, knowing that the Lord Jesus is coming, we should be alert and looking for his arrival, shouldn't we? I I hear people all the time saying, oh, I hope Jesus comes soon, and Jesus is coming, and it won't be long till Jesus gets here. Well, if that's true, are you living like he's coming? I mean, are you ready for his his arrival? I'm not talking about being ready in the sense of being saved. I'm talking about being ready when he walks through the door. When he comes to the clouds, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trump, are, we, are you living ready for that? That if Jesus came and, and, and picked you up, you'd be able to not be ashamed at his appearing. We're supposed to be alert, having control of ourselves morally and spiritually. And we should be excited about being saved. How come, you know, do people know you're saved? They ought to know you're saved. We ought to be excited about it. We ought not to be ashamed of it. That's hiding your light under the bushel, right? Have you ever caught yourself maybe in a situation with someone and, and, you, and naturally some spiritual language wanted to come out and you, you squashed it? You said, well, I'm not going to say that. I don't want to say that now. Why don't we say it? How about a praise the Lord once in a while? See what happens. Praise the Lord. You'll get eyebrows. They'll say, what? Glory to God. What? How about this? Well, I need to pray. I need to pray about that. Here's what we say. Well, I need to think about that. You need to think about it. Christians, we don't need to think about it. We need to pray about it. And we ought to just say, well, you know, I need some time to think about this. I need some time to pray about this. And they're going to look at you like you, you know, came off of the ship from uh, some other planet. But that's okay. We ought to be excited about being saved. Listen, we ought to be excited about being a child of a king. And not just a king, we're the children of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We ought to be excited about being part of the kingdom of God and about knowing the truth. Does it excite you that you know the truth? Yes. It excites me. Yes. I was delivered from the false teachings of the world and I saw the truth in the word of God and God opened my eyes and I'm thankful. I'm excited about it. I know where I'm going when I die. How about you? Yes. We shouldn't be asleep. We should be vibrant. We should be awake. We should be alert. We should be active in the cause of Christ. He says this, Therefore let us not sleep as do what? Others. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about different groups of people. He's talking about the unsaved, of course. They're they're dead spiritually. You can't get more asleep and yet still be alive than that. But you know, he may be referring to other Christians. Let us not sleep as do others. I think as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ, there's going to be more and more compromise on the part of Christians and more and more slumbering, sleeping Christianity. You've got to decide what part of it you're going to be. You're going to be the alert and awake and active part, or you're going to be the slumberers. We need to get up off the couch, amen? amen. So don't sleep. Number two, go to Acts chapter 27, verse 25. Acts chapter 27 and verse 25. Now this is the Apostle Paul speaking here and he is in a ship and he's on a voyage and this is the famous passage where the ship that gets into a storm, they didn't listen to Paul. Paul said, you know, we should just stay here and winter here and they said, ah, what do you know? You're just a, you're just a prophet. You're just a man of God. You don't know nothing. We're sailors. We're going to take care of this. And they went out and got into the biggest storm they ever saw in their lives. They were so scared, they were throwing things off the ship. They were tearing the ship apart and getting rid of every weight and every excess baggage they could get rid of. And by the way, that's not a bad thing for Christians to do. But anyway, they were throwing this ship apart, tearing it apart, and uh, Paul's just sitting there. And they're all frantic and in a panic and sinking like the Titanic, and Paul's just sitting there. And finally they they talked to him and said, what in the world's up? And here's what he said. Verse 25, Acts 27.
for, sirs? Be of good cheer. <laughs> Can you imagine that? They're like ready to, you know, die, screaming and yelling and running around. And he says, well, for, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. An angel came to Paul and said, Paul, don't worry, nobody's going to die. And Paul said, God said it, I believe it. That's why I'm able to sit here and be of good cheer. Point number two is, don't weep. Don't weep. We should be of good cheer. If anybody ought to be good cheer, it's us, amen? There are too many dowdy, sourpuss, down in the mouth, what's the matter with you, Christians? What kind of message does that send to the people around us? We're in perilous times. We're in the last days. And we're walking around like sourpusses, like we've been sucking on lemons all day. Paul said he was of good cheer because he believed God. We ought to be of good cheer because we believe God. Amen. Do you believe God? Amen. Do you believe the Bible? Do you see what he says to us in the Bible? Do you see what he promises us in the Bible? He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us, and he'll supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He tells us that he's coming to take us home. We'll be in heaven for all eternity. Amen. We ought to be of good cheer. He says, no temptation will take you, but such is common to man, and God is faithful, who will also provide a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. We ought to be of good cheer. But my boat, my boat, it's sinking. Believe God. You'll be of good cheer. Listen to some instances of when people were told to be of good cheer. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2, Jesus told a man who was sick of the palsy, be of good cheer. How do you tell a man who's sick of the palsy, be of good cheer? You know why? Because his sins were forgiven him. I don't know what your condition is. I don't know what you deal with in life. But you know what? Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. People are dying and going to eternity in the lake of fire because they don't have Christ as their Savior and their sins aren't forgiven. Yours are. This is just, you know... This is just a little speck of our existence here on earth. And our second one is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus told the disciples on the sea. You remember when they were in the ship and it was going down and they were sinking and Paul told them uh, 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 they, were, they were struggling there. And remember Jesus came walking on the water and they thought they saw a spirit. They were scared to death. I don't know about you, but that would scare me. I mean, they'd never seen anybody walk on the water before. You understand? And there you are out in the middle, and it's in the dark. It's about three, anywhere from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. It's dark. It's scary. It's windy. It's billowy. The waves are all over the place. You're, you're already scared. And then here comes somebody walking on the water. And you're thinking, it's got to be a ghost. It can't be a person. They're scared to death. And what's Jesus say to them? Be of good cheer. What? Be of good cheer. You know why? He said, be of good cheer. It is I. It don't matter what you're going through. If Jesus is there, you can be of good cheer. Why? Because it's him. He said, it's I. It, is, it is I. We don't have to be enough to be afraid of when I'm around. What Jesus said. Then you go to John chapter 16, verse 33. And Jesus told the disciples, they were, he said, in the world, you'll have tribulations. Wow. That's a sour stomach message, isn't it? What if I came in here and preached a whole message and nothing, but you're going to have troubles, you're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations. And that's all, I, that's all I said. He said, in the world, you'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer. But be of good cheer, for I... See, there he is again. It's him again. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? He said, I've overcome the world. Listen, friends, the world's going to give you fits. And the world's going to give you trouble and tribulations. I mean, really, you think about it, um, there's a lot of heartache in this life. When I was just down at the hospital, standing by the bedside of, 
of our sister who went to be with the Lord, there was a lot of sorrow in that room, a lot of heartache, a lot of crying, a lot of trembling. It hurts. But be of good cheer. Because he's overcome the world. That sister that was laying there isn't laying there. She's with Jesus. Can you imagine? No, you can't. But we can try to, can't we? What it's like. You know, the Bible says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. You know what it was to God? It was God saying, honey, it's time to come home. Little girl, time to come home. He saw it as a great thing. He was waiting for her. He's waiting for us to come home. Man, we can be of good cheer, can't we? Even in the midst of our, our, our tribulations. And then in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, Paul was in prison. And the Lord said to him, be of good cheer. Even in prison, we can have good cheer. Over and over again, believers are told to be of good cheer. And I want you to notice that all the instances Instances when people were told to be of good cheer were instances of trouble, terror, and tribulation. But isn't that when we really need to hear, be of good cheer? When things are going great, you don't need to hear, be of good cheer. You're already of good cheer. But it's when we get down and when we get in those situations that are too big for us, that's when the Holy Spirit of God, through the Word of God, comes to our heart and says, be of good cheer. It is I. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How is that possible? Because we believe God. If you don't believe God, it won't work. Right? But if you believe God, then it will work. Now, there are three reasons why we're not able to be of good cheer. At least three. I'm going to give you three of them. Number one, a complaining spirit. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's why it's, we can't be of a good cheer. God's saying be of good cheer and we're saying no. I can't. You ever say I can't? I can't. Well, Jesus wouldn't tell you to do something you can't do. He wouldn't tell you to do something that he won't enable you to do. So if he says be of good cheer, that means you can be of good cheer. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10 says this. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. You know, it's hard to be of good cheer when you're in the act of complaining, murmuring, and being pessimistic, isn't it? Some folks can find something to complain about in any situation, no matter what. You know, in the wintertime, it's too cold. In the springtime, it's too wet. In the summertime, it's too hot. In the fall, it's too windy, and now you're back to winter again. So now I get to complain again. A complaining spirit. You know, a complaining spirit is someone who's just not taking time to stop and listen to what God has done for them and what God has for them. We can complain about everything. Pessimistic attitude. The glass is always half empty. Huh? Instead of half full. Number two is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You see, a complaining spirit, a grumbling and murmuring spirit, will keep you from being of good cheer. But then a comparing spirit will also hinder your being of good cheer. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not what? Wise. You know, it's hard to be of good cheer when you're always looking at someone else. When you're always either, you know, comparing yourself with somebody that's, quote, better than you, or comparing yourself with someone who's not as good as you. First of all, if you're comparing yourself with people who are better than you, you're going to discourage yourself. It leads to grumbling. But if you're going to compare yourself to those who you think are not as good as you, now that leads to pride. So God says, you know, it doesn't work. You don't look at somebody else and compare yourself to them. They're not the standard. If you're going to compare yourself to someone, compare yourself to Jesus, there we all fall short. Amen? There we all need help. And the only one that can help us is Jesus. 
But we shouldn't have a comparing spirit. We shouldn't think that everybody should be like me. Everybody should be like me. Everybody should have the energy I have. Everybody should do what I do. Everybody should, uh, you know, perform like I perform. That's pride. Instead of that, you just ought to be thankful you can do what you can do. And you know what? Then there's those who say, well, I can't do anything. Really, you can't do anything. Can you think? <laughs> Can you pray? Huh? You know what? If you couldn't walk and you couldn't talk, you could still pray. If you couldn't walk and couldn't talk and couldn't see and couldn't hear, you could still pray. Nobody can ever take that. As long as you are alive, you can still pray. And prayer is a powerful ministry. Matter of fact, I, I think... I, I hope, I, I'm, I'm counting on, a, on people having a prayer ministry. I hope you're praying. And if you're not, shame on you. Men ought always to pray, the Bible says. So sometimes we get that comparing spirit. It leads to discouragement or it leads to pride. You know what? Just be you. Just be who you are in Jesus. You know, he made you different than he made me. And you should be glad you're not like me. Because I'm glad I'm not like you. No. <laughs> but we, we're, we're different and unique, every one of us. And we can't look at someone's circumstances and their outward appearance and their, what it looks like on the outside and think everybody's wonderful. everything's wonderful in their life. You don't know nothing about that. God, get, God gave you certain gifts. God gave you certain talents. God gave you certain abilities that are different than someone else's. So don't compare yourself. Just be who you are in the Lord. Number three, what else keeps us from having good cheer? James chapter 4, verse 13. So you can have a complaining spirit. You can have a comparing spirit. And then I think I see in James chapter th uh, 4 and verse 13 a calculating spirit. James chapter 3 or chapter 4, I'm sorry, in verse 13. Look what he says here. He says, Go to now, ye that say, Tomorrow, or today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For, for that you ought to say, If the Lord will. Look at the first one. We shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will, we shall live. You know, if the Lord wills, I'll be alive tomorrow. And if the Lord wills, I'll do this and that. Now, I have my plans, you know. I have what I think I'm going to do tomorrow and what I want to do tomorrow. But that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. What if God, you know, your life can change in an instant. You can have anything planned out and all of a sudden something happens that throws all those plans out the window. You going to trust God? See, we can get too calculating in our life. These guys said, we're going to go down to such and such a city, and we're going to stay there for such and such a time, and we're going to make us some money down there. And God said, you might not even be alive tomorrow. What are you boasting about? Presumptuous. We can become very presumptuous with God. The problem is, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, and look with me at verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, and what? Self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. This presumptuous attitude, this calculating attitude. Sometimes Christians have an entitlement mentality with God. An entitlement mentality with God. We have our expectations, don't we, of God. We have our expectations of what God is going to do for us, what God should do for us, how God should do it, when God should do it. We get presumptuous. That's a characteristic of unsaved people. And we have a Christian entitlement mentality. And then when God doesn't come through, and when God doesn't meet our expectations, guess what? 
we're not of good cheer because we were more concerned about our self-will than we were concerned about God's will. You catch me here? Look with me in Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Romans chapter 9, verse 20. The Bible says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? We can ask God so many why questions, can't we? Lord, why don't I have this ability? Why don't I have that talent? Why am I made this way? Why am I made that way? And he says, You're just, you're just the clay. Who are you? Who am I? to sit in judgment of God and, and, and reply against Him as if He made a mistake. Christians that are expectant instead of dependent. See, there's a difference, isn't there? Go with me to Psalm 62, verse 5. See, well, sometimes we have a complaining spirit, sometimes we have a calculating spirit, sometimes we have... Psalm 62, verse 5. I'm waiting for you to get there. I need to get there. Psalm 62, verse 5. He says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. You know, the only expectation you can have of God is what He has obligated Himself to in the Bible. Now, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. So I can justly expect God to save my soul if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? We heard about all those verses about peace this morning. Those are just expectations. I can expect to have the peace of God if I'm where those verses tell me to be. That's a just expectation. I can expect God to take care of my needs, but I do not have a just expectation of God to take care of my desires. See, the things I want. But God's good. And he gives us not only what we need, but he gives us what we want. Yeah. Amen. When it's good for us. Yeah. See, we need to have the proper kind of expectation. An expectant, calculating, presumptuous spirit will always give occasion for feeling down in the dumps when things don't work out according to those expectations. We are not to have a weepy spirit brought about by a complaining, calculating, or comparing spirit, we should be encouraged and be of good cheer because we believe God. And then number three, don't, don't, don't sleep. Why? People are watching. Don't weep. Why? Testimony before, the, before others. But then the last one is Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Don't sleep. Don't weep. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, don't bleep. Look what it says here. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Christian, we must be careful of our language. If our lives were being filmed as they happened, there should never be any instances where they had to bleep anything out. Huh? You ever see those bleeps? Bleep, bleep. People are saying things they shouldn't say. That ought not to be true of us. I, I guess our life is kind of being filmed. It's being viewed by the angels in heaven. It's being viewed by God. And there shouldn't be any occasions for bleeping anything out in what we say. Go with me to James chapter 1 again. James chapter 1, look with me at verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. The word vain means empty. Uncontrolled language is a sign of empty spirituality. No matter how impressive he or she may seem, no matter how they may perform, if they can't control their language, 
then their, quote, religion isn't doing them very good, is it? I remember one time I was standing on the, on the sidewalk and uh, a fella come by and I handed him a track and wanted to witness to him and he took the track and uh, he said, well, I'm a Muslim. I said, really? He said, yeah. So we started talking and I started asking him some questions he really couldn't answer and then he started swearing at me. And I said, is that what your religion, how your religion teaches you to talk? And he just swore at me some more and left. So uh, the only conclusion I can come to is, guess so, right? Well, what about us? When people hear us and we're saying things we ought not to say, using words we ought not to, ought not to use as Christians, they're thinking, is that what your religion teaches you? You walk around like you're somebody and then you talk like that? over James chapter 3, verse 11. He says, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. The idea is here that you either have a salt water fountain or a fresh water fountain. You can't have one that has both because as soon as you combine them, it turns to salt water. The salt water ruins the fresh water. What he's trying to say is, when your speech comes out of your mouth and it's not what it's supposed to be, it ruins everything you say. It, de it destroys whatever you've said before that. You know, it, it's like Lot, when Lot went to his children, remember that? He tried to go tell his children, hey, God's going to destroy this city, you've got to get out of here. But the Bible says that Lot vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, and his kids said to him, well, what are you talking about? Where, where did all this come from all of a sudden? We've seen you. We know your testimony. Well, who are you come up here telling us this stuff? That's what happens when we allow the wrong words to come out of our mouth. It destroys the testimony from when we want. Look, we want to go tell somebody about the gospel, but they heard us say this or that. What's well, going to make them want to listen? The same mouth should not bring forth blessings and bleeping. Our mouths are to be sanctified for the Lord's use. Once a word or words are out, they can never be put back in. Our words are to have three, should be three things. Let's look at them and we'll be done. The first one, our words should be words of truth. And for this we're going to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Our words should be words of truth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Wherefore, put, putting away what? Lying. Speak every man what? Truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. He's trying to give the idea here that when you lie to your brother, you're lying to yourself. So we ought to have words of truth. The second, look in verse 29. Our words ought to be words of edification. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The word corrupt is sapros, it means morally rotten, bad, or worthless. Those, not, that, those ought not to come out of our mouth. Those morally bad words, those jokes. You know, somebody will say, you know, hey, I'll tell you a joke, and I'll look around and see if there's any ladies around. Well, if you can't tell it when the ladies aren't here, don't tell it when I'm here. Or, well, we, I, want, I don't want the kids to hear this. Well, if, if they can't hear it, maybe you ought not tell it to me, right. you know? Look at ver chapter 5, verse 4. Talking about our words, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. The word jesting here, speaking of immoral innuendos. Those kind of jokes I just mentioned. Then you go to, go to Proverbs. I know we're going to a lot of verses, but that's what it's all about, isn't it? Amen. Go to Proverb number 18 and verse 8. Talking about our words. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down 
into the innermost parts of the belly. I'm talking about gossip. We ought not to be gossips. We ought not to allow tail bearing and gossip be to come out of our mouth. Why? Because they hurt. Go to Proverb number 15, verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Wow. The word perverse here is salaf. It means viciousness. Vicious. Have you ever said anything vicious about someone or to somebody? It's a breach in the spirit. It also means distortion. Don't distort things. And then you go to proverb number four. Keep going back to proverb number four. Talking about our, our, our words. And we look in verse 24. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. That means false or crooked. And so we're supposed to have words that are truthful. We're supposed to have words that are edifying. Words that build people up. Words that encourage people. Words that are a blessing to people. And then lastly... We should, we should, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's look at verse 15. We should, our words should be words of, go, of the gospel. An account that the long-suffering... That should be 1 Peter. I'm in 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Here we go. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always. You see, it says, be what? Be ready. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's the gospel. We're to be ready at any time to give somebody the gospel. And he says here, they're asking you a reason for the hope that's in you. In other words, they know you know Jesus. They know you have some hope they don't have. They know that you have some peace they don't have, some joy they don't have, something. You got something they don't have and they want to know what it is. And the Bible says you are to be ready to answer them. Now what if you have spent your time with the wrong things coming out of your mouth? Then they'll never ask you. We need to be ready. You know, God wants to send somebody your way to hear the gospel from you. And my question tonight is, are you ready? Amen. Are you ready with the gospel? Could you tell somebody how to be saved? Could you use Bible verses to tell them how to be saved? Amen. If you can't, you need to get in the book. You need to get those down so that you'll be ready. Because someday somebody's going to come to you. If you keep your lips clean some, and your life right, somebody's going to come to you and say, Sir... What must I do to be saved? Ma'am, how, how, how are you going through this? And you're not bitter. And you're not complaining. You've got to give an answer. God is concerned with the character, the quality, and the content of our speech. How can one expect others to listen when we want to use our tongues to share the gospel if they have heard corruptness, perverseness, gossip, and guile from the same lips? We must remember that our conversation is constantly paving the way for the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we want to influence our generation for Christ, then we need to be concerned about the choice of our words, the subject matter of our speech, and the manner of our delivery. And be examples, as Paul told Timothy, to be an example of the believer. Don't sleep. Don't weep. And don't bleep. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. What a wonderful opportunity lies before all of us as believers in this dark day in which we live to be that shining light we talked about at the beginning. But sometimes we put a bushel over our light by being asleep at the wheel morally and spiritually. Sometimes we put a bushel over our light by being, having a complaining spirit and not being of good cheer, believing God 
And sometimes we put a bushel over our light by the very words that come out of our mouths. And maybe tonight we need to come before the Lord as Christians and say, Lord, I, in these last days, whatever time I have left, I want to be a shining light for Jesus. Because really, after all, when our lives are over, nothing else is going to matter. It will all be forgotten and left behind. Only what we did for Jesus will last for eternity. Maybe there's someone in this very room who's never been saved. You've never been born again. Like Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you know in your heart that you need Jesus. You know your life is empty and there's a spot that you can't fill with anything in this world. Only Jesus can meet that need. And maybe tonight you'd like to ask the Lord Jesus, the God of heaven, to forgive your sins and save your soul, to make you his child so that you can be a shining light for him on this planet and spend eternity with him someday. You say, preacher, I know I need to be saved. And I've put it off and put it off, but I know tonight's the night I need to do it. And I'm willing to pray right where I sit, and I'm willing to ask Jesus to forgive my sins and save my soul, and I want to do it now. I'll help you. We'll pray together. You look up at me if that's what you want to do. You're looking at me because you're saying, preacher, I know I need to do this. It's something that's been on my heart for a while, and I've been putting it off, but I know tonight I need to get saved, and I don't want to wait any longer. Anybody like that? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your love, for your mercy. Thank you for being a Savior. Thank you for all the good things that you've done in our lives since we've known Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that we can be of good cheer because we believe it will be even as you said. And Father, we pray tonight that you'd help us as Christians to be a shining light. That Lord will not have the, all these different bushels we're putting on our light but that would shine for Jesus. Help us not to embarrass you, but help us to be a ready witness. Guide and direct in the invitation, my Lord. And if there is somebody in this place that needs to be saved, I pray you'd help them to have the courage and come meet me at the front so we can help them to get saved before it's too late. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. Number 611. Take my life and let it be a shining light for thee. If that's your desire, that's your heart, maybe tonight you need to come and say, Lord, I, need, I needed to be reminded about that. For sometimes I can get a complaining spirit. Sometimes I can get a comparing spirit. And sometimes I even get a calculating spirit. And I get upset when my expectations aren't met. Sometimes. Why don't you just come? Say, Lord, here I am again. It's me, your child. I want to talk to you again. Aren't you glad he'll always listen? He said, him that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. He'll never turn you away. His hand's always stretched out still, isn't it? Saying, come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He'll give you rest. We're going to sing. You come. If you need to be saved, I'd like to talk to you. You come and see me right here, right? As we sing on the first. Take my life and let Sacred it, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days Let them flow in ceaseless praise Let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Swift and beautiful for thee. Take, Take my, my voice and let me sing always only for my King. My lips and let them be filled. Messages from thee filled with messages from.
from thee on the fifth. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. Let thy feet each treasure store. Take myself. close us in prayer <clears throat> thank you father god for the message that we heard tonight lord and even in this song that we uh, just sang lord uh, the take my take my take my and it says to use it all for you take myself and i will ever be only only all for thee ever only all for thee father this flesh of ours can get in the way father god our lips can say the things we wish they hadn't said but Father God, you are a forgiving God. Help us to remember that we are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we meet people in public, Lord, and they ask us for the hope that is in us, we'd be able to answer that, Lord. Father, just be with us as we head out tonight, Lord. We thank you, uh, Father God, uh, for salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, be with the Wilamowski family, Lord, as they deal with this loss, Father God. And uh, just comfort them, Lord through this time, Father God. And we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's close with 796. One verse of seven. Sing this out loud. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. One verse. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy. Darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. Here's the great part. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. We're going to finish it. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Amen. You are dismissed.